Greetings, this is the video lecture for HIC Chapter 7 in the Intro to Social Welfare course. In the last chapter we focused on poverty and in this chapter we're focusing on issues related to employment and so you'll see some overlap or expansion of the concepts that we talked about last chapter. We talked a lot about employment and full employment and unemployment and here we are talking about it again. So HIC gives us some information about how we define people who are employed and people who are unemployed. The normalization of paid labor means that we want to know something about who is working and who is not working within the paid labor force. And so HIC introduces us to the concept of employment ratios and emphasizes the concept of labor force participation and unemployment as two of the ways in which labor participation is measured within a Canadian context. He also reminds us that 15 years is the benchmark for being included within these statistics. The labor force participation rate creates a ratio measuring the number of people who fall within the working age population and the number of people who are participating in the labor force. We know that factors like gender, age, race, ethnicity, language, religion, and ability and a few I'm sure I forgot, sexual orientation, can affect the uh, levels of labor force participation, bringing us back to our previous discussions of exploitation. The unemployment rate measures the number of people looking for work who fall within the designation of being an employable person. So the unemployment rate may provide us with some important information, but it also leaves a number of people who might want to work but who've given up on working out of the equation. We subdivide the category of people who are unemployed into uh, additional categories. And so Hick introduces us to the concept of frictional unemployment, which is the experience of unemployment someone has as they move between jobs or are returning to the workforce. So, for example, many social workers work on contract. You might have a year contract at one place and a two-year contract at another place. So, if you're moving from the conclusion of that one-year contract into your next contract, there might be a short gap, a month or two, a week or two, between the end of one job and the beginning of another. And so we would understand this gapping as frictional unemployment. Whereas cyclical unemployment speaks to changes in the economy that create new unemployment. And that this level of unemployment or employment changes and shifts over time. There are times when the economy contracts and lots of people lose their jobs, and other times when the economy expands and many workers are hired. Although it seems as though we have more shrinking than we do growing within the labor market. Many people <clears throat> experience underemployment and this is another concern for the Canadian economy and for the welfare state because it means we're not using all of the resources that we have within our society effectively. Underemployment is the experience of doing a job that requires significantly lower levels of education and skills than the worker actually has. So for example, when I finished my master's degree and I moved back to Ontario after having finished school in Nova Scotia, it took me about a year to find a permanent job. In the meantime, I worked in a health food store. So the health food store job was fun, but it really didn't use very many of my social work skills. Occasionally I used a few, but in that circumstance I was underemployed. And underemployment is an experience that many people have within, the within their work life, but in particular newcomers and immigrants face underemployment, where their skills, training, and ability from another international location may not be honored or respected within a Canadian context and therefore they're forced to take other kinds of work. 
Another measure of unemployment and employment rates is the employment population ratio. This ratio looks at the overall population and the number of people who are engaged in employment in, within this overall population. It's an interesting statistic because it tells us something about how changes in the economy can change the number of people who are working, whereas the job creation rate might only tell us how many jobs are created, but a single person might have two, three, even four jobs, so the number of jobs created doesn't necessarily tell us about how the ratio of employed people changes in the overall population. This kind of information might also be useful for thinking about things like how many people are contributing to the Canada Pension Plan. It tells us more than just the average contribution. There are many factors that influence unemployment and levels of employment, and we've already talked about some of these generally, but to be more specific, the economy definitely affects the level of unemployment in Canadian society. Sometimes we talk about the idea of business cycles, or that there is, you know, an ebb and flow to the, to the expansion and contraction of business. We talk about industrial adjustments. We might have a technological advancement that changes the way we engage in things like manufacturing, and this can affect the number of uh, people who are employed in a particular sector. For example, in the auto sector, technological advances in things like welding in the 1980s greatly reduced the number of people required to work in auto production. So these levels of, of production-related uh, technological advances definitely change, uh, change our, our level of employment. We also talk about this idea of production and productivity. Well, again, technical advances can sometimes mean that we can produce more things with less time or that we can produce something more efficiently. Um, so for example, extract more oil from less tar sands, meaning that we need to take less of the tar sand out of the ground before we uh, actually process it into oil and gas. Of course, many people would argue we shouldn't take any of the tar sands out of the ground, but that's probably a different course. We've talked a lot about the idea of full employment and the idea that under a capitalist economic system, full employment is really not something that's particularly desirable because it means that you have to provide more wages and more benefits to people in order to get them to work for you rather than working for a competitor if you're someone who owns the means of production. There have been many conversations in Canadian history about the idea of full employment. And in the post-war era, the Canadian government was very much committed to full employment, finding places for men who had returned from fighting in the Second World War, and finding good employment for them that paid a living wage was an important part of rewarding them for their service during the war. There is definitely a recognition that the government has some power to control levels of unemployment and through things like monetarist policies and through stimulus policies we are able to increase the level of unemployment. However, we haven't elected to make that commitment to full employment because we've made other commitments to things like a market economy. And so, in about 1971, we developed what was considered to be an acceptable rate of unemployment, which was around 4% of the population. The idea of structural unemployment is a controversial one. It's the idea that unemployment exists because workers do not possess the skills necessary to do the kinds of jobs where job vacancies exist, or who do not live in the region where work is available, or they're unable or unwilling to work at the, for the wages that are offered. So, for example, there may be jobs in a particular sector, but the wages that are paid in that sector are seen as too low to make doing the job worthwhile. And so certainly we see in the service industry, in fast food restaurants, for example, or in other service type industries, uh, like retail sales, there are often vacancies because it's extremely difficult to support yourself on the minimum wage. And few, if any, of these employers pay the minimum wage.
The exception perhaps being Alberta, where service industry jobs pay generally more than the minimum wage. But there are very high costs of living in the oil sector areas of Alberta, where there are higher levels of unemployment and higher levels of population. And so even though these jobs pay more than the minimum wage, they're still not living wage jobs. Many scholars have researched the idea of skills as a way of making employees more marketable, or workers more marketable, or humans more marketable. And there's an argument to be said that not everyone benefits from skills development. One would have to be very strategic about the skills that one developed in order to increase their potential for unemployment. But of course, I have to be careful as I say that. As a university instructor, I'm sure many of you are here because you're wanting to get the skills that you need to get a job. Other structural factors that Hick outlines to us is the idea of labor surplus. So this is the reality that there may be more workers trained in a particular area than are actually needed. If you look in the profession of medicine, for example, there are a number of specializations, such as orthopedic surgeons, where there are more people trained in the area than there are jobs. So people who are trained as orthopedic surgeons may experience unemployment, even though we have long waiting times for orthopedic surgeries, like hip and knee replacements. There may be a gap between the skill supply and the skill demand. So for example, a particular set of skills skilled workers may have the qualifications to do a particular job, but there's not a demand for that kind of work. We also know that sometimes people have an experience of unemployment as they move between jobs. So you might end a contract as a social worker working, say, in a hospital on a one-year maternity leave contract, and you have obtained a job on another one-year contract covering someone, someone else's maternity leave, but this time in a children's aid society. Well, there might be a slight gap between the conclusion of one job and the start of another. And so you would be understood to be unemployed, whether it's a week, two weeks, or a month, or two months, between the conclusion of one job and the start of another. We also know that in a Canadian context, we have a lot of seasonal employment. We have a lot of agricultural work, and we have a lot of outdoor work that we just can't do in the winter. So if you're a roofer, for example, and you work in Ontario, you're probably not going to be working very much in the wintertime when roofs are covered with snow and the temperatures are bitterly cold. At the same time, if you're a vintner working in the wine production industry, there's a particular time when grapes get harvested and turned into wine. And so during the rest of the year, the other six months, let's say, you might not have any work to do. And so this would be understood as a factor influencing unemployment. And then finally, internal migration. In the last slide, we talked about the potential that jobs may exist in another area of the country. And so someone might leave their home community in order to travel to a new community, establish themselves, and seek employment. And so the period of time when they were unemployed between leaving where they were and getting settled where they want to be, that also would be understood as a factor, a structural factor, influencing unemployment rates. As we've mentioned several times previously in this slide deck and in uh, earlier slide decks, there's definitely a relationship between what the government does and experiences of unemployment. Again, particular monetarist policies and particular Keynesian style stimulus policies can directly affect the uh, levels of unemployment that people experience. A few slides ago I mentioned the idea that just because we have an, an increase in the number of jobs doesn't necessarily we have an inc mean that we have an increase in the number of people who are working in the paid uh, work economy. So part-time employment is something that is becoming increasingly a lived reality for many people. Some people want part-time employment, and we would understand this as voluntary part-time employment. But other people would really like to have a job. But in fact, they're unable to find a job. So they work at multiple jobs, all of which are part-time. And we understand this is involuntary part-time work. The number of part-time jobs has dramatically increased over the last 30 years, and it continues to increase. 
People who are at the beginning of their careers or who are youth are more likely to experience this kind of part-time employment and a kind of cobbling together of enough hours to hopefully meet your bills and responsibilities. We know that workers who work part-time are more likely to live under the low income cutoff and to experience lots of poverty. These jobs, again, tend to be more marginal jobs, more precarious jobs, more likely to be contract or temporary. We also know that part-time workers are much less likely to be in a union, and as a result, their wages are on average $5 an hour lower than workers who work in unionized contexts. Expanding on this idea of involuntary part-time work, I think it's important to note, as Hick has, that recession, and in particular the recession of 2008, which we sometimes talk about in relationship to the mortgage crisis situation, has definitely increased the amount of part-time work that people, are, that people are working at and that people have access to. So this kind of increase in the number of part-time positions that we have can be understood to be a kind of tenuous recovery. We've talked about recovering from the recession of 2008, but we haven't bounced back to the same levels that we were at prior to that recession. We also know that for many people, working part-time makes it difficult to qualify for employment insurance, and so therefore they have fewer benefits than people who work full-time. This may be also true of Canada Pension Plan contributions, as only certain number of work, only only workers who participate in work for certain numbers of hours are eligible to contribute to CPP and therefore eligible to receive PP, CPP when they retire. We've mentioned employment insurance a few times since we've begun looking at this PowerPoint presentation, but employment insurance is a, an insurance-based program <clears throat> that provides people who have experienced unemployment under certain conditions. So for example, they have, they have been displaced from work because of a layoff as opposed to being fired for some kind of misconduct. And they are therefore eligible to receive certain benefits which replace part of their employment income. EI pays about 55% of a person's wages up to around $420 a month. It may have changed a little bit since the last time I looked at it, but the last time I looked at the statistics, it was actually $416 a week. There are a lot of conditions to receiving employment insurance. You have to work a certain number of weeks or a certain number of hours in a certain period prior to claiming benefits, for example. So it's a complicated program that provides support for some, but not all. As you know, social assistance provides a minimum income support to people who don't qualify for employment insurance and who have no alternative. Self-employment, or what some people might refer to as entrepreneurship, is another option for, um, for finding work. So in these uh, contexts, someone basically creates a business for themselves or turns themselves into a business. And they sell their particular skills and labor, their particular production capabilities, to people who are willing to accept their... to... to purchase their services basically. So for example, when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I had a small business doing transcription. So I would take tra tapes from researchers who were doing large projects who wanted to have an audio recording of an interview done with someone typed out. And so I charged them an hourly rate for doing that typing job. And that was my self-employment activity. Again, the definition of part-time uh, work is someone who works less than 30 hours each week. And again, it can be voluntary or involuntary. And that seems kind of like a strange place for this in the slide deck, but I guess we take what we can get. So part, pardon me if there's a bit of confusion there. The minimum wage is something we've talked about a few times. It's a, a ma a minimum level of payment for hourly work that's set by the provinces. 
A significant portion of the Canadian population who are at work work for the minimum wage, about 6%. And so this minimum wage income often makes it difficult for people to meet their basic needs, to pay their rent, to pay their bills, to purchase their groceries, to take the bus. And so in many circumstances, the minimum wage is actually believed to be below the low income cutoff. There may be some areas of the country where you can get by on the minimum wage, but certainly if you're living in Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver, it's a challenge. People who are marginalized, young workers, older workers, women workers, racialized workers, are workers who are more likely to be in the category of a minimum wage earner. And I should also mention people with a disability would probably fall into this category, except people with disability have among the highest unemployment rates in Canada. Some people argue that the minimum wage is something that really works against the economy and that an employer should be able to decide how much someone should get paid for their work. Others disagree, saying the minimum wage is an important part of setting a minimum standard for the value of work. Youth unemployment is an important concern at the present time. There are very high levels of unemployment in Canada, even among people who have completed post-secondary education. The less the if you have less education, the the le I don't know how you'd say that, but when you have less education, it's more difficult to get a job. Although Having a lot of education doesn't necessarily mean you'll get a job, but does increase the probability. Regions like the region of Durham are investigating youth unemployment, and we know that both the federal and provincial governments have made a commitment to invest in youth unemployment and to create employment programs for youth. Some people have termed the NEAT generation as a, as a symbol representing the reality that we have a lot of youth who are not in employment, who are not in education, either because they've completed or they've dropped out, and they're not in some kind of a training program. Canada is not alone in its experience of youth unemployment. It's kind of a global phenomenon that started most recently with the recession of 2008. The recession displaced a lot of people from jobs in areas like the industrial sector, the auto industry, and service industries related to the auto industry, like parts manufacturing or, or fabric sewing for seat covers, for example. And so the folks who've been displaced from these industries have taken jobs in service sectors, like fast food service work or retail service work. And so these jobs that were traditionally held by youth are no longer available because they're filled with adult workers displaced from other sectors. This means that youth don't have an opportunity to gain some of the basic skills in work. So things like being punctual, dressing the way you're supposed to dress, learning to follow the policies and procedures, and so on. And so this makes it more difficult for them to get other kinds of work because they're seen to lack basic skills and basic experience. Some people, some scholars, suggest that people are delaying retirement as well. Once again, we might link this back to the recession of 2008, where some people who previously had pension plans lost those pension plans or lost investment income that they had invested in RRSPs, for example. And so they're delaying retirement, staying in their own jobs, not opening up jobs for youth. Employment insurance is a federal program, so it's a program that's administered by the federal government. And again, it provides temporary income replacement to workers who are eligible. Oh, 501. 501. I was wrong. 416 last time I checked. Now $500. Sorry. Could be the difference between groceries and no groceries, so it's an important number. Anyway, um, there have been a lot of changes to employment insurance in the last 10 years, and it seems as though the criteria for receiving benefits gets tougher and tougher. And so fewer and fewer, fewer people are actually eligible to 
get benefits. There's been a real change in attitude by the federal government. And so, for example, seasonal workers are seen as repeat users rather than workers who experience lots of unemployment because of the kind of work they do. And so in many cases, some of that British poor law discourse gets uh, imbibed on people and they are accused of being in some way lazy or unmotivated and therefore ineligible to receive benefits, justifying the government's move to reducing eligibility. Workers' compensation is a provincially administered insurance-based program. Employers pay a contribution into the workers' compensation plan, and this contribution covers workers on their job site or in their employment location. If a worker has an injury or an accident on the job and is hurt or harmed, or is exposed to some kind of harmful substance, like say asbestos, and that harmful substance causes an illness, like say cancer, then compensation is paid to the worker. The compensation is paid on the basis of a no-fault plan, so the worker does not have to sue the employer or take the employer to court in order to get access to the benefits. The benefits are not paid by the employer, but by the workers' compensation plan, so through the provincial system. Workers can receive rehabilitation or treatment to speed their recovery or maximize their potential recovery. Workers who are no longer able to do the job that they did before can receive retraining to learn a new job. If the new job pays less than the old job, then workers', workers compensation will pay the gap between the old wage level and the new wage level, potentially for the rest of someone's life or until they retire. You'll see that on Blackboard I've included a couple of short YouTube videos produced by WSIB, which is the Ontario Workers' Compensation Plan. These videos are interesting because they present some of the potential kinds of injuries or accidents that might happen on the job that you might never have thought about. Unemployment insurance or employment insurance, depending on what era of the insurance plan you're talking about, is something that was created during the Second World War. This kind of insurance-based program is a global phenomenon. Many countries around the world have insurance-based programs to protect workers against unemployment. In fact, we see by this slide that Canada was kind of short or kind of slow on the t uptake to provide unemployment insurance benefits to its, uh, to its um, population. Employment insurance provides more than just benefits for people who have experienced some kind of unemployment. It also provides benefits to people who experience sickness, who are engaging in caregiving, either as a parent who's adopted a child, given birth to a child, or who is the parent of a child, or to people who are providing care to a member of their family who is terminally ill or who has a chronic illness that has experienced some kind of a flare and they require at-home caregiving. There are sometimes training opportunities available or retraining opportunities available for people receiving UI or EI, we don't have UI anymore, who did receive UI. And again, as I mentioned previously, there have been an awful lot of changes to the employment insurance system over the last 10 years. The changes made to employment insurance, previously known as unemployment insurance, in 1995 were quite significant. First of all, the name changed, as I mentioned, from unemployment insurance to employment insurance. And this change in title was really meant to be a signal to the general population about the fundamental changes that were being made to the program. No longer was the point to protect people while they were unemployed. It was a greater, there was a greater focus on ensuring people were employed and remained employable if they did experience brief periods of unemployment. Changes to the program included a calculation of workers' hours, a factor that we might understand as reflecting some of the significant changes in the structure of employment in Canada during this era, and the movement from full-time work to part-time work, which we discussed earlier. 
Changes in the way benefits were calculated really reduced some of the benefits that people could access, and there were much stricter rules about who could access benefits. For example, once upon a time, if you quit your job because of circumstances that made your job undesirable, you were eligible for unemployment insurance because you were understood to have contributed and paid into the program meeting the minimum requirement. Well, once the changes from UI to EI were made, people could no longer collect benefits if they left their job voluntarily or if they were terminated with just cause a change that made our system reflect the U.S. system more closely. So we might indirectly understand some of these changes as related to the North American Free Trade Agreement. Other restrictions on accessing unemployment insurance were implemented at this time, and the complexity of these is to some degree covered in the textbook, but probably extends beyond what we need to know at this point. But I guess it's fa fair to say there was more or less and less more in terms of the changes that were made. With one exception, the minimum level of payment to people who earned low incomes and were collecting unemployment insurance was raised slightly to provide some protection for low income earners and to reflect some of the challenges associated with the calculation of the low income cutoff. The 1990s were an era of retraction overall. We had a lot of shrinkage in the economy. Recessions plagued us during the 1990s. The price of housing in Toronto, for example, dropped quite significantly through, during this era, and I'm sure dropped in other places as well. The 1990s hailed a time when we could understand Canada's social service safety net, our social welfare safety net, to be eroded by government plans. These plans have continued to be a part of the policy-making agenda of federal governments and, as a result, have influenced the decision-making of provincial and municipal governments. A another set of changes to employment insurance was implemented in 2008, and yet another set has been implemented more recently, again restricting the uh, access of certain people to benefits, providing some flexibility from region to region around the way in which programs are designed, but also penalizing seasonal workers for repeated use of employment insurance. We know, however, that EI funds, or the funds contributed by employers and employees, have generally speaking seen surpluses in, in the last uh, probably 20 years, with the exception of the period in the 1990s. So the reserve funds, rather than being used as a kind of nest egg that we might draw on when times aren't as good and more people need the benefits, it's been used by government for other reasons. For example, paying down the debt or gapping deficit funding of other programs and services, including things like corporate tax breaks, which are seen to stimulate the economy. As I mentioned in a previous slide, there are a variety of different benefits that people might access through EI. The last bullet point in this slide, the fishing benefits um, commentary, refers to extended and extra benefits paid to people on the east coast of Canada who lost their capacity to earn a living by fishing. We know that in the 1990s and early 2000s, there were significant reductions in the fish stocks on the East Coast. It became necessary for the Canadian government to place a moratorium on fishing in order to ensure that the stock remaining, the fish still in the ocean, were able to reproduce and replenish the fish stocks that had been lost due to overfishing. Many communities on the East Coast, re, re, they survived exclusively on money from fishing industries, fishers who caught fish, but also plants and packaging centers, shipping centers, where fish were processed and moved globally to markets. Without, these, without the fish, there was no need for the other industries. And so the government had to step in, 
provide extra resources and supports to retrain, relocate, and redevelop the areas so that people could have other opportunities for work. The most recent changes to the employment insurance plan have really emphasized the idea of a rapid return to work. People seeking employment are expected to be more flexible in their understanding of the work they would like to do and are willing to do, whereas previously there was an understanding that a, an, a worker could take all of their EI time to find the job they wanted to find, so long as they could prove that they had been engaging in a work search consistently over the time they were receiving benefits. Under the new provisions, the government can pressure people to return to work, to take jobs that pay less than what they earned prior to their layoff, to take jobs in lower status areas of employment, and to take jobs to which they must commute. This redesign of the system has been reflected as an any jobs is a good job mentality. The changes to the maternity and parental benefits associated with employment insurance have reflected some changing attitudes at the societal level, as well as perhaps some encouragement on the part of government for people to accept new kinds of families and new kinds of roles. For example, men are now eligible for parental leave benefits rather than only women being eligible under the maternity provisions. The fact that men are eligible for benefits may encourage some men to take a leave in order to participate more actively in childcare activities. There are another, a number of other changes that have happened in relationship to maternity and parental leave, including the recognition of same-sex couples eligibility for these benefits and changing attitudes towards things like adoption, expanding the number of hours, or pardon me, the number of weeks of benefits payable to people who are adopting so that they are on par with people who are on other forms of parental leave. <clears throat> Efficiency and equity are two of the concepts that Hick introduces in relationship to this discussion of employment-related benefits. We know that there is a focus under neoliberal regimes to measure efficiency as a kind of best way of performing, with efficiency being understood as getting the most for the least amount of money. We're not really sure what the most is. We don't necessarily define it when we talk about efficiency. It might be the most people served. It might be the most something else but it's definitely this idea of the most for the least. But there are also debates about equity and the idea that particular kinds of resources and benefits need to be provided to people as a level of justice or as establishing a level of justice at the social level and that this process of equity sometimes means that there is an there that not everyone gets the same level of benefits but that generally speaking, there is a need to create a redistribution of resources and recognition at the social level in order to create a greater level of fairness within the community. Hick asks us if we, have, we can have both, and I guess that's something that you might want to discuss or think about because it's a debate that people face when they're practicing as, so, as social workers on a regular basis. Hick introduces us to the concept of a social investment state. We might understand this phrase, social investment state, as a term that kind of counteracts some of the conversations that are introduced at the social level by more conservative uh, ideological positions which argue that we have to invest in the market in order to have a successful society. This perspective suggests 
We have to invest in individuals. We have to invest in society in order to ensure that we have some of the resources necessary in order to have a healthy market economy. Governments see investing in people and in the resources and services people need in order to have a minimum standard of living as a way of creating a healthy workforce, a healthy consumer force, and a healthy society overall. Governments do this through things like policy development, through program development, and through the funding of these policy and program activities. It's kind of a moving target because as demographics and social conditions change, as technology evolves, and our way of using and serving technology changes, we also have to change the rules policy concepts and programs that we develop. We might also cha change definitions like what inclusion means. Once upon a time, having a computer at home wouldn't have been seen as social inclusion. But with the internet and the advent of social media, social inclusion includes an online presence. So developing a social investment state is an ongoing battle and a moving target. This brings us to the end of the video lecture. Thanks very much for paying attention, and I'll see you at the next lecture.